Matt, Ray, welcome to the show. So why don't we just start off, if you could say a few words about who you are and about your company, Higher Ground Education. Sure. Um, uh, thanks for having us. Uh, Ray Gern, I'm the CEO and founder of Higher Ground Education. Uh, I started out as, a, as an educator, um, ran a school, and ultimately got into kind of the business of education and, and um, fell in love with the Montessori vision kind of for, you know, educating to the human potential for a new approach to education. And I spent my career trying to implement that. Matt? I'm Matt Bateman. Uh, I am the resident philosopher at Higher Ground Education, I guess you could call me. Um, and my background is in philosophy, psychology, intellectual history. And um, I bring a lot of that perspective to our program development, to our teacher training, and just to our thinking as an organization in general. And yeah, I, like, I fell in love with Montessori about 10 years ago and never looked back. Well, for those who don't know, can you give us a little bit of a background on who Montessori was and what her approach to education is like? Sure. So Montessori was an early 20th century, kind of first half of the 20th century um, psychologist, developmental psychologist, um, pedagogue, um, pioneer in the field of education. So she did a bunch of different things, but it was really centered around the theory and practice of early childhood education in particular. Um, and she, her life is an incredible story. I mean, she was one of the first doctors to be trained in Italy in modern times. Um, she, um, she was an iconoclast. She was always kind of, she was one of these charismatic people that was always kind of like bullying and charming her way through, um, through prejudice and through, um, through, through the status quo. Um, she became famous for, um, t taking these, um, one of her first school projects, she took these poor slum children in Rome and gave them more advanced literacy and academic skills than the best aristocrats in Europe were getting. And that, that really put her on the map and people were like, what are you doing? And it turned out that she had this whole philosophy of education based on respect for the child, based on agency, the dignity of the child um, that combined this really thoughtful and innovative, rigorous construction and preparation of the environment that the child was growing up in. She has this almost like world simulation that she puts children in with a pedagogy that gives them a lot of freedom and agency um, and, and kind of creates a certain classroom culture. And those two things mix to create really great academic results, really great um, social emotional results, really great characterological results in terms of the kinds of people that it produces um, at a very, very young age. And there's a lot that goes into that, but that's um, that's the kind of thing that she was the most famous for. And she did that for about 50 years. Um, she's, she saw a lot of uh, ingenuity and progress and also horror during her lifetime and she kind of she pushed through that and related her education system to that as well um, but that, that's that's, and, that's the short version yeah and subsequently the Montessori movement um, you could say is a kind of global movement uh, that's largely grass, grassroots you know and you can go to you know any corner of the world and there's someone that believes that Montessori is the solution to the problems of the world and yet, even today, it's one or two percent of children in the world get even a year of a Montessori education. So it's relatively um, small in its realized impact, but um, also at the same time, one of the largest alternative pedagogies that's out there that has traction. So uh, you know, we think it's well, it's one profound and true, but also well positioned to to really drive cultural change. So the main reason I wanted to have you guys on was to talk about your experiences building up this really successful um, group of Montessori schools. But before we turn to that, I, one of the things that I found really striking is, I mean, Montessori has some really eloquent and insightful things to say about human progress generally. And I wonder, Matt, if you could just give us an indication of how she thinks about the issue and its importance. Yeah, she is. She's a very interesting thinker in terms of her background and influences. And um, I mean, she's like she's like a Catholic kind of original old school Marxist who started thinking about these issues in a really novel way from a kind of Thomistic Aristotelian perspective. And so she's this kind of she's this very unique perspective and this blend of influences. Um, but um, she she said a lot of very, very positive things about civilization, material progress, industrial progress, 
Um, she had a term for civilization. She called it super nature. Um, and she thought that it was a good thing. She thought that it was like, we have mastered nature, man, as the king of the cosmos. Um, and we, we've, we've kind of gone on this journey, the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution have, have put us above um, the kind of survival concerns. We still have survival concerns, but, but they put us above the kinds of um, the kinds of survival concerns that most animals and organisms grapple with in a state of nature. And we're the masters of nature in a certain way. And that's a good thing that's to be celebrated, that's to be understood. And it's not celebrated. It's something that we take for granted. And so she, she's, she was very astute. I mean, if you think about her dates were um, the 1870s to the 1950s. So she saw, I mean, she saw a lot of terrible things in her life, um, two world wars, a global depression. Um, and she experienced a lot of it very directly. She, she lived in Europe during, during most of that time. Um, but she also saw electrification, the airplane, the automobile. Um, she saw the rise of modern medicine, a kind of medicine that really worked. Um, she, she saw all sorts of things and she wrote about them in a very positive way. And she was disappointed in humanity and, and kind of like, we just invented the airplane and the telephone. People are already taking it for granted. So, so you know, that kind of like that Louis C.K. bit, like, like everything is awesome and nobody's happy. Like, like that kind of like taking for granted of progress that a lot of people are, have, have taken this fresh eye to in the last few years of like, we don't understand how good we have it. She was on about the same thing. And part of the reason why she was on about it is she thought that um, it had really deleterious effects on our conception of, it was, it was related to certain kinds of prejudices that we brought to education and childhood. So her view was that, um, A, that, um, that children build themselves up and create themselves and turn themselves into adults. So it's not the case that children are this kind of annoying nuisance that you have to kind of batter into shape and eventually they turn into adults and hopefully they don't annoy you too much when they're young. She thought, no, the infants on this journey, they have this inner spark, they're creating themselves, they're putting in the work, they're teaching themselves to walk and talk. And even if you do nothing, like they do a lot in, in terms of growing into an adult, and turning themselves into the person that they are, they're like a little inventor. And in the same way that we take inventors for granted and kind of scientific progress for granted and material progress for granted kind of in, in civilization at large, we don't ask who gave us these things, how did they come to be? We also don't ask, how did the adult come to be? What is the work that this child is putting in to turn themselves into an adult? And we give ourselves too much credit in certain ways and we just don't, we're just incurious in other ways. Um, so she, and she thought that those two issues were related. She thought like work, achievement comes from work thought and work, children put in thought and work, adults put in thought and work, and you've gotta, no matter what horrors exist or what defects exist, you've gotta kind of acknowledge the good that exists as the result of somebody putting in effort and thought. Um, and then on the other, um, so that's A, like she, she thought this was important for understanding childhood. And then B, she thought that teaching children, connecting children to the history of material progress was a kind of critical bedrock factual history, kind of like what actually happened to get us to the point where we are today? Who did it and what happened? Not even not even in a kind of like Whiggish ideological, like rah, rah way, like humans are great. Like we're all neoliberal, like, no, it was just like, what what were the discoveries? What kinds of things do people have to overcome and question um, to, to make them? Um, you know, how did we get tools that were less brittle? How did we get mathematics? How did we get the airplane today? Like just really specifically learning the details of that. She thought that that was a basis for um, a kind of grandeur about humankind that extended beyond the material that was really kind of like, like you should have an, you should fall in love with humanity was her view, like in a deep way, not just material progress, but like the human spirit and material progress is a good historical example of how to do that. And she thought that it should therefore have a kind of central place in the curriculum. Um, and so her, I mean, her view of humanity was like, we're kind of spiritually stunted and cynical yes. and things are getting culturally worse, but that if you look at material progress, that can be fuel for reframing humanity and falling in love with it and, and, and kind of recasting things. And she thought that that should be part of the curriculum in a kind of subtle way, so. Um. She has this great um, passage, you know, again, as a Catholic where she says, we give thanks um, to God, but um, not to man, God's prime agent of creation, right? And like she, and she has this like real, emphasis particularly with children that that, that we have in, in a sense um a responsibility to help them fall in love with the world with nature with industry with human history because it's out of that love that all good things come um and i would underscore one other point um that matt made but uh uh connecting montessori's own work to kind of the broader issue of progress is that she really sees work 
as fundamental as at the kind of crux of human development, like self-creation through work. So it's not love and affection. It's not co content. It's not, uh, you know, certainly not rewards and punishments. It, it, you know, it is work. Like work is the form in which the human being, you know, creates himself, creates herself. And it is, it is, I think the thing that she regards as quintessentially human, like the capacity to engage in this kind of purposeful, concentrated activity. Um, and, um, and it's just infused in her education method. And, and it's certainly kind of, you know, uh, I think something that we, we've embraced as pretty, pretty core to development. So I'm always interested in, you know, the starting point for companies. So Ray, if you could take me back, what was, was it, an idea, an insight, a goal. Where did higher ground come from, as sure. an, as an idea? Yeah, and you know, and the kind of experience extends to my previous company uh, before higher ground. But in intellectually, uh, theoretically, it, it, you know, this is born out of an identity crisis professionally, and and the, you know, the kind of essence of it is that I. I and, and the people I was working with, we, you, you could say we we're kind of more classical kind of great books educators, really concerned with how do we make deep knowledge about the world, about literature, history, science, mathematics, accessible to a developing child? How do we make it not about quote, content or academics or, you know, empty memorization, but like, you know, imparting this, um, you know, in, these insights about the world so that, you know, the children that we were educating can use them to live their own lives. And then we discovered that the preschools that were kind of feeding into our schools were Montessori and the, 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 um, the whole philosophy, the whole orientation was very different. It was that the child is the agent, the child is the driver, get the hell out of the way. Like let this human being create herself. And, and, you know, we, we weren't really tempted to have the kind of progressive kind of, um, you know, uh, in, in the kind of, any, kind of anything goes approach, but yet we, we felt like, there was something wrong in, you know, segregating children by age and putting all eight-year-olds in one room and all nine-year-olds in another room and, um, and started looking at the history of education and really thinking about like, what, you know, going to first principles and what is, like, what is the nature of this issue? And, you know, came to the conclusion that like, that this is in a sense, the issue in education. How do you impart a definite set of content and skills that, you know, adult human flourishing requires while uncompromisingly respecting the agency of the child and recognizing that we are passengers in this child's life. And we thought that the Montessori, particularly the, the gold standard is the three to six Montessori classroom, um, was her, her genius was that she accomplishes 100% of both. And, and then started to think about what does that look like from birth all the way through adulthood, right? Um, um, that was a big insight. And then the second insight, which is kind of more, more you know, somewhat more tactical, but I think really profound as well, um, was that everywhere we looked, there was an absolute divide between K-12 education on the one hand and early education or child care on the other. So different regulatory bodies, different university departments, different trainings, different attitudes, different funding sources, whether you look at premium private schools, you know, uh, an independent school might start at three or four years old. It certainly doesn't start at three months old. Meanwhile, these massive, you know, daycare chains that are providing care to 100,000, 150,000 kids a day, um, they end at four or five years old and don't think about K-12. Um, in the public sector, Head Start programs don't talk to public schools. There's like no coordination. Again, even funding sources are different. And it was bizarre once we started thinking about it, like this is one process for child, for family, for educator, and just vistas of opportunity open up um, um, developmentally for the child and kind of for the family, but also commercially and strategically, just from the act of seeing it as one process and thinking about it as a kind of integrated, you know, um, um, experience of growth from birth to adulthood. So, um, you know, a few other, those two insights, a few insights about ed tech and other things while we were running a school, um, really kind of created this, this, uh, aspiration and this hunger to, to try something different. Um, and that was, you know, 15, 18 years ago. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, we've been at it for a while and, 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 you know, made a lot of mistakes and, you know, learned well, not wanna... to be so brash, but, but figured, you know, figured out a lot as well. Yeah. Well, so one thing that I think we should clarify for people. So it's not that you guys run a school. So can you say something about the kind of scale of what you're doing and what your, your aspirations are? Cause I think that's a, a sure. bunch of what I want to mine is about the challenge that I think is 
really difficult in education. You read historically about schools with really engaged founders who get magnificent results, but it doesn't scale. Like it, it's just this one yeah, home and, school. And, and, yeah, and we have a lot. I have a lot to say there. We've done a lot of thinking about that. I mean, in a sense, we came into the organization trying to solve that problem. Um, we operate about 90 schools across the world, uh, mostly in the United States. We have six in China. We have one um, that will was closed because of COVID. We'll reopen in Europe and a couple more coming. We're, we're on a pace now of opening 40 schools a year comfortably. Um, most of those are zero to six preschools, but we go all the way through high school. Um, and the kind of vision is, you know, on the front end, a kind of baby center, uh, which is a is companies and parents will know, um, like uh, like a service that just provides, you know, um, support for parents and parenting for independence. You know, sleep training, nursing, sibling rivalries, all the stuff that we've been doing for years, productizing that. Um, that's going to launch in a couple of quarters. But then from there, everything else we already do. So if you're a stay-at-home parent and you want uh, you want to um, implement a Montessori environment in the home, you can pay us fifty dollars a month. We'll send you materials. We'll send you support. You have access to coaches and community. If you want a nanny or an au pair, we can train one and place one in your home. And then you can obviously come to one of our schools, which started six, eight weeks old. Um, and, and you can travel through the system. So my five and six-year-old have been to 20 cities. We, we, we're designing this to allow for travel. We're partnering with the Department of Defense to allow for travel. We're, you know, we're really creating portability of education, which Montessori is very attuned to and, and you know, awesome for. Um, and then that it just carries on, you know, as your child approaches elementary, you can do homeschool, you can do virtual school at home, you can have a home pod, and then, you know, you can have our standard brick and mortar schools. Um, at middle school, so our brand at the younger ages is called Guidepost Montessori. And the theme of the brand is, you know, we want to be the village that supports the parent in raising the child. At middle school, the brand changes to um, Academy of Thought and Industry. That's our middle school and high school brand. And, and there, it's a little bit edgier. The focus is now this emerging adult. They're participating in the network. They're the ones that have partnerships and friendships, even though obviously parents are still paying us um, and kind of in the private school. We're really directly the coach and the partner of, of this adolescent rather than the parent. But, you know, it's one system all the way through. And then... Um, um, and then, and then, in terms of how is that possible, that type of rapid scale, and I think you know, quality at scale, our quality only improves as we grow. Um, it, there's not a tension. There's actually a kind of convergence. Um, it's possible because we've identified what I think are the four key drivers of great education at scale. So, the first is, a, you know, curriculum and pedagogy. You know, on a Montessori foundation, like what is the right actual approach to educational content and, and systems. Um, the second is, uh, uh, teacher training, human capital. Like, you know, you, we knew very early that we have to solve the talent problem, like talent, you know, I'll, I've often said talent is the only silver bullet. There is no other silver bullet. And so we need to be able to address very proactively the fact that, um, you know, we need people that are soulmates and yet, you know, there's not that many trained teachers. So how are we going to solve for that or train school leaders? Um, the third is real estate, and we've done some pretty interesting things on real estate that I'm not happy, happy to get into. Um, one, one thing that's relevant is, you know, everyone told us that real estate investors are the most conservative asset class. They're not going to partner with us in the way that, you know, we wanted to model, but it just turned out not to be true. And things that are hard are not impossible. And, and we figured it out. And that's been a big driver of our success. And our real estate developer partners have been very important to our ability to grow and scale. Um, and then fourth, we call it whole school management. And you can think of it as like um, operating technology plus best in class um, retail practices, just recognizing we're taking people's children. Like this is the most demanding customer service dynamic in the world, you know, and their money, right? The two things they love most in the world, right? And, 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 like, and like, you have to kind of like take that seriously. You have a lot of people in, in tight confines interacting daily and just like the, the cultural demand of that and getting that right and the need to orient um, um, and, and keep perspective. Like it's, it's not incidental to the issue of why schools don't scale. It's at the heart of it. And it's what we've been trying to solve for. Happy to talk more about it. But that, so it's like those four drivers. I think we're doing something radical in each of those. And we believe that those are both necessary and sufficient to, to you know, create our kind of vision of education at scale. 
Yeah, well, and in particular, I'm curious about the hiring part because I saw, I mean, one of the things I, I've, uh, my wife was an educator for a while. I was educated at one time, sort of. So I, I and one thing that is very I was hyper aware of is that, you know, a quality teacher makes all the difference. And as you say, they're not lying around just like waiting to be plucked. There's, if you're growing that many schools, how do you ensure um, that there are teachers who share your vision and are equipped to actually uh, engage in it? Because I mean, part of it is, you know, a, it's not like hiring workers for an Amazon warehouse, right? You're, you're bringing in people who are autonomous in a fundamental way, who are professionals, who are have to make a lot of independent judgments about what this particular kid needs now and how do I deal with this kind of unusual situation or solution. So it's the getting a lot of people who are able to do that to me always seemed like that's, if not an impossible problem, it was certainly one that would have intimidated me at the outset. Yeah. So I'm very curious as how you guys think yeah. about- um, Can I say a little bit about that? that? Yeah. yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, so um, I think that the you're only describing 50% of the challenge. So um, the challenge is, I mean, especially if you're looking, you know, for through high school, um, the challenge is both in having somebody that can do that that can like make a bunch of individual judgments about a developing human being and get to know them and relate to them and, um, and really support them in an individualized way. And like all the, all the kind of complex nuance and, and humanity that goes into that kind of relationship. And you need somebody who can teach them stuff, um, who, can, who can kind of support the learning of their core skills and knowledge. Um, so in elementary, you know, the three R's in high school, kind of more advanced science, like, like all, there's all this stuff that the students need to know. And there's not a parent on earth or a child on earth that doesn't need, I mean, this is part of what education is for, is you're, you're enculturating the children into the kind of knowledge and wonders of human civilization. And that's, for some things that just kind of happens, but for a lot of really important things, it doesn't. And it's its own knowledge base and skill set. And the further you go, the kind of more complicated that knowledge base and skill set gets. Um, part of the, part of the premise of what we're doing, and this is really, and this is part of the reason why we look to Montessori is that she, Montessori separate, successfully separated out these two functions in early childhood. So in the three to six classroom, what she did is she, she herself working with and from, um, some really ingenious psychologists and learning theorists. Um, and she herself was also um, uh, like an incredible educator and pedagogue and, and knew a lot about math. She, she designed learning materials that really materialized a scope and sequence, like a really killer curriculum for this age period um, where um, children learn things like um, the, the phoneme graphing mappings or the complexities of the decimal system and, and kind of how it's represented. Um, and how, how, you know, when you shift a number to the left, you're going up an order of magnitude, like these complex things that are really at the foundation of what it means to be literate or numerate. Um, she figured out a way to kind of embed these in materials, make them accessible to children. Um, um, now the teacher has to know something about this curriculum in order to deliver it, in order to connect students to it. But a lot of that pressure is, to, it's not like the, the teacher has to figure out how do I teach these children how to read from scratch? Or, um, or using some sort of really subpar, like, I don't know, like some sort of reader or textbook that like, I mean, what most teachers do is they, they get some sort of set of learning materials, a textbook, and they're like, okay, like this makes some sense. It's a good starting point, but really I have to kind of reinvent the wheel and figure out how to, how to relate this to my children. Um, the, the whole, a lot of that is kind of solved at the level of program design. And then what the teacher can focus on is how do I relate to the students? How do I create a certain kind of culture? And, and what we can focus on in our hiring is teachers who, have the right kind of, not just love of children, but the right kind of love of children, like a love born of this kind of respect for, for their potential. I'm not, they're not like loving them like teddy bears. Like they're so cute, but it's just like, there's a human being here. And like, I, I wanna relate to them and help them on their journey. There's a lot of people like that. There's a lot of people that basically have that, that kernel and that attitude. And then we give them the skill set to understand this existing curriculum and, and to know how to relate it to the children. And it's once you kind of parse those functions and, and the more you develop the curriculum and the better you get and the more you've kind of parsed them, 
the more you can kind of like drill down on each and analyze them and, and kind of turn them into a training, the more you can focus on hiring the, the people with the right kind of soul. It, it, it's, it's still tricky. Like, it's not like this isn't a silver bullet. This is a bunch of lead bullets. Um, but, but it works. Like, I, I think it works. Like I, I take my, I've taken my daughter to a number of our classrooms, my now 17 month old daughter. She gets a great experience wherever she goes. Um, I don't pick classrooms on the basis of like, this is a great teacher. And like, I'm going to the best teacher in this, in our best school. I just like I'm going to Texas. So I put her in Brushy Creek and it's great. Um, and, and the, the driver of it is a certain kind of training and program development approach that separates out subject matter expertise from this kind of coaching developmental support function. Let me just ask one clarification question because people who are familiar with Montessori might know that, you know, there's training programs that exist as distinct from Montessori schools. And usually a Montessori school isn't really training the teachers, right? They're hiring externally trained teachers. How do you guys deal with this? So we have, I mean, we have our own training center. So we, um, we knew from the, from the outset, I think Ray might've mentioned this in passing a minute ago. We knew from the outset that, um, um, kind of finding trained Montessori teachers and relying on other training centers was going to be a major bottleneck to our approach. Um, we're already training about a thousand teachers a year, um, maybe more, and we're, and we're ramping up to kind of increase that to an order by an order of magnitude. Um, um, that's really the goal. Um, and, um, you know, this is, this is one of those things that we decided, like we had, we had to be, a, we had to develop this function internally. It had to be best in class, it had to be accredited. We've gotten it accredited by the U S department of ed. Um, and we want it, and we want it to be like really global. Like we're training, you know, our competitors, teachers, like this is not just an in-house function. This is, this is part of our impact mission is figuring out how to bring Montessori training to as many people as possible. So it's a, it's a whole division of the organization called prepared Montessori. Yeah. And, you know, the, the kind of approach we took to this talent challenge, you know, based on observations and insights that, that we've had over the years um, is an expression of a, of a broader approach that tied to one of our values, like practical idealism, which is you have to treat everything as in scope. And so if the challenge is accreditation, how are we going to solve that? If the challenge is that, like, you know, if you're on the premise that there are great human beings everywhere, which is the premise that we're on, then it's like, how do we unlock that? And how is it that any 16, 17 year old that's decently educated can do calculus when it's the genius of the ages to figure out calculus, right? Like, how, how does that happen? It's because, you know, um, we learn and we simplify and we isolate. And I think that I think that there's a, you can like the, the instincts and the intuitions of, of, a, of a teacher, especially with the younger children, like, Yes, you have to find the right mindset, but you can, you know, someone that loves kids and is ambitious and wants to learn, like, and has the right type of pathway and environment to learn can, is capable of doing this great work. And I think that is part of Montessori's achievement. Um, and as I talked about, like, you know, if, you, if you're decoupling the subject matter expert from the coach, a lot more opens up. Like, and then it's like, if you look at that problem and you say, well, it can't be done for X, Y, Z reasons, like, is it really that it can't be done or is it just hard, right? Um, I just had this conversation in a totally different context about hiring engineers in the Philippines and like talked to a bunch of, you know, people I respect and got some feedback and it's like remote teams have this problem, that problem. It's very hard to have kind of remote engineering teams, even though there's just waves of talent. And it's just like, you have to think about it. Like, okay, well, what is the problem? What is the nature of the problem? Is there some way to solve for it? You know, is there some alternative solution if this solution doesn't work or is too expensive? Like, you know, treating it as solvable, I think just kind of having that orientation um, leads you to a view that actually pretty much anything is solvable. You know, it has to be at the right scope and, you know, it's not easy, but um, if we weren't, if we weren't able to solve the teacher training and, um, you know, the kind of, um, challenge of finding great talent, then, then, you know, it would be tantamount to say our mission is achievable. Well, that leads me to, so we've been talking about the kind of mm. scalability of talent and hiring, you know, hundreds and thousands of teachers, but one of the things I, you know, Ray, I've known you a long time and you've mm. always yeah. been very good at spotting talented people and your leadership team, I think has 50% of the people I think are the smartest, most creative people <laughs> that I've ever met. So how do you think about um, like talent spotting and then creating an organization where all of these people who are very independent minded, very creative, and I'm sure don't always agree in things can, can flourish and help build an organization of this. Scale? Yeah, sure. In terms of talent spotting, 
Yeah, in terms of talent spot, you want to say something, Matt? I have a lot to say. say. I really want to hear your answer to this question. <laughs> yeah. In terms of talent spotting, um, it's a habit. It's like, you you know, I think that you think about, all, like, we do have a lot, the density of talent we have. Like I, I, you know, I, I say a lot, I walk amongst giants and like, it's such, you know, it's one of my greatest rewards in terms of doing this work. But the number of conversations that I have that lead nowhere, the number of conferences you go to and you're like, wow, I just wasted three days, right? I'm like, people it's not it's not just automatic you have to you have to treat it as work like to go out there to meet people to listen to care and then you have to make sure that I, I do it in part because I'm naturally and generally interested in people I'm never bored at a party like I don't even understand how you, there's a human being in front of you if, if what they're saying is boring I start thinking about like well do they know it's boring and like are they aware of that like there's always something to contemplate about this person right and I think that you know, I would either, you know, as a, someone that's leading an organization, you either do it yourself or you have to find someone that's doing that because um, I, my, my attitude toward talent is like talent is a venture game, you know, not a kind of private equity game. You're not looking for the 20% return. You're looking for the 20X return. And you have to somehow go through enough, meet enough people, interact with enough people, you know, such that you, you are surfacing those people that for you and your particular mission and purpose, there's just that affinity and that alignment. And um, I both cannot imagine a world in which I'm not working with the people that I'm working with and I see them as completely irreplaceable and believe that there's other people, you know, none of us, you know, are irreplaceable. There's other people out there. I just got to go and find them. And like, in a sense, like the, our success of our mission hinges not on like 30, 40 or 3000 or 4,000 people, but, you know, finding three or four more people like that, you know, in the next couple of years. Right. Um, um, to, but but related to that, and I think maybe kind of more interesting, the second point, like the, you know, we've really calibrated our culture and our core values to this issue of like, how do you take great people and help them work together? How do you scale an orientation towards the world? And I, you know, I'll walk through a few examples, but you know, I, I get the privilege as an individual and we get the privilege as an organization of trying to be Phil Jackson rather than trying to be Michael Jordan because of the way that we've set up our culture, right? Um, and um, so, you know, just to take two examples. So one of our core values is mission without martyrdom. And we want to be all in on our mission. We want to be able to push ourselves. We want to be able to push each other. We want to be able to email people in the evening at midnight and, you know, and demand, you know, um, this and that. And how do you do that without worrying about like, are you taking advantage of people? Are you exploiting people? Is this right for them? And that people aren't bearing a cross for the organization, right? Um, well, you build it into your values. You bake it in mission without martyrdom. Like th that is a core value that we're missionary, but we're not martyrs. And then anytime you start feeling like a martyr, like there's a whole set of resources and rituals and cult uh, things that happen to, to align like you don't have to do this work right um you maybe there's another role or maybe you know you you want to kind of um uh just recalibrate in a certain way um so that value is necessary to be truly all in on, on the mission and not worry about mo like a manager doesn't have to worry about whether someone on on, on his or her team is being pushed too hard or is like not spending enough time with their kids because we're constantly remembering mission without martyr, right? It just, it, it'll naturally surface because of the way we've, we've attuned the organization to that. Or, or a second example, uh, one of our, another core values, unbreached trust. And the way that we formulate this value of unbreached trust is if you feel like you've been wronged, if you feel like someone's taking advantage of you, if you feel like someone's not seeing your value, um, the onus is on you to raise that thing and to repair the breach. Not the person who did the wrong. Like if you if you're wrong, as part of your job, you can't just, you know, you know, kind of like carry that grudge for two, three months. You have to, as part of your professional role, you have to surface it. And what that does, when you orient it that way, what that does is it again allows you to move a mile a minute and have people stepping on each other's toes and getting in each other's ways and accidentally saying the wrong thing. Because um, by the nature of the way that you've set up the system people, those things will naturally surface and then have to get resolved. And you, you're not going to wake up six months later and realize, oh, wow, like there's all these people that are full of resentment or all these ways in which someone's gone wrong. It's going to come up. Now you do have to have leadership that then deals with it. But, you know, uh, in example after example, we've really thought about like, 
how do we orient towards skills? And the same thing is true at the school level values, right? Like um, um, in terms of, you know, the guidance that teachers are given and, and, um, and, and I see that as a type of technology. Like I see that as like, it's, it's like, it's, it's, the, it's a technology of the soul, right? Or it's a psychology. It's like, it's, it's, it's building a system of scale to deal with the human complexity that otherwise kills organizations that are trying to engage in rapid growth. Can I add something? Yeah, I was yeah. curious what your experience has been like, Matt, and um, I'll put this either as something that you can focus on or as a follow-up yeah. because um, part of your talent spotting, Ray, is many of these people in your leadership team don't come from an education background. I mean, Matt, you can say a little bit about like how you became interested in education uh, as a career choice given, I mean, your background is in philosophy, which is not usually what people do before they start helping create a, you know. I'll say one sentence on that and then I'll turn it to Matt. My one sentence on the kind of continuum from do you value expertise and experience or do you value just like raw potential um, and just like, hunger and, and, and talent. Like I'm definitely on the far end of this continuum. Now that, 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 that isn't quite right because it's, it's expertise in education. Like there is expertise in other areas, but I think that's a good, good thing to call out. Yeah. I mean, um, I did not get into philosophy because I wanted to because I love teaching philosophy. Like that was not um, like, I mean, teaching philosophy, anybody that goes into an academic career, especially in the humanities, and if you're intending to be a professor, which is what I intended when I started, teaching is a part of that, a big part of that for the vast majority of people. Um, but I didn't think about it that much, honestly. And when I found myself um, as a TA for the first time, when I was like 24 or whatever, um, I was a terrible teacher um, and my, I hated it. My students hated it. And I was very, I was very introverted and mousy and it just kind of conflicted with my temperament. And I didn't know what to do about it. And um, I had, um, I mean, this is more about my journey than about the organization in general, but, um, but I had, a, in grad school, I, I kind of, I was like, what am I doing with my life? Like, this is a part of my career. Do I want it or not? Um, and I decided to give it a go. And to do things like I need more energy, so I'm going to pump myself up in the bathroom before before my sections, and like you know do stupid power poses and things, and it worked. Like it kind of, I mean, I, it was like turned me into this like weird bipolar kind of schizophrenic person for a while, where I was like, you know, mousy in my personal life and like really like a muppet in, in my in my teaching career. Um, but um, but it worked, and it, it kind of like changed who I was, and it, and, it, and it attuned me to issues of what is the nature of teaching and instruction and motivation? And like, I, I started asking all of these questions about how to do it right because I started off terrible at it. Um, and that, I mean, that was, that plus a bunch of other things. Like I've always loved kids. Like I was always like the boy babysitter when I was 12 years old. Like I never thought of that as like my career, but like it was an interest in the background. I was pretty primed for Montessori. I think when I saw it, I, like when I first saw a Montessori classroom, I was like, oh my gosh, like these elementary students are better critical thinkers than my college students. And they're like, doing all these amazing things. I remember, you know, working with kids when I was a kid or even being a kid and like building a tree house and like that kind of deep concentration that I think is so valuable. Like these kids have it in this classroom. So just all these things kind of came together at once. And it was one of these, like, you know, how Steve Jobs says like the dots don't connect like while you're drawing them, they only kind of connect in retrospect. Like that was definitely true of me. But I think that that's true of a lot of people. I mean, a lot of, for a lot of people, um, everybody grows up everybody has an education of some sort um and every like a lot of people have like lingering questions or curiosity about it or they want to have kids themselves or um, like education is a lot of people's second careers um it's like nothing is more common than like you're successful and then you like want to explore a project in education like that is extremely common um and there and there's rhetoric around like you just now you want to actually help somebody like you've made you know you've like made money selling ads and f just for cigarette companies and now you want to actually help somebody but i think really what's underlying it in a lot of cases is people are interested in it it's a question that people are naturally interested in and, and once they kind of um feel like they can do whatever they want with their lives for various reasons or, or they're looking for a second chance or a rebirth um people gravitate towards it that's true of a lot of people um <laughs> There's also the activity itself, Matt, like yeah. you're doing a lot of the same things. Our real estate people, our engineers, like they, they're, they're, they're 
they're really interested in the subject matter and the, in the, the mission, but actually like they're doing the work that they want to do. It's not like in many cases, there's not that much change in terms of the type of daily work. Yeah, that's true. Um, the other thing, the thing I was going to say, just in response to the general talent question, like how do you, how do you flame spot? You know, like how do you attract talent? Uh, I think I'm pretty good at this, not to pat myself on the back. Um, and, and part of the, um, there's a kind of intellectualism and, and first principles orientation in our culture in terms of what, how we think about our mission, what we need um, from people, like what we identify as a good person or a thoughtful person that really cross cuts a lot of the categories and judgments and approbations and disapprobations and, and like the things that pe- would kind of like naturally draw your attention to someone and be like, oh, this is an aligned person or not. I think they're different for us. And, and um, um, I mean, an example that Ray, I've heard Ray often give is like a teacher who like genuinely and for for kind of principled reasons and empirical empirically grounded reasons think that, you know, young children should be exposed to iPhones and iPads and that they should do their work on the iPads. Like that person is more of an ally than somebody who kind of secondhandedly thinks like, no, you should have all wooden materials, even though in our classrooms, the latter is what we do. And it's because we're looking for a kind of first principles thinker, um, a kind of even even a kind of like independent, like heterodox bent, um, even just like, just in terms of my own intellectual influences, like Montessori, I've always been drawn, like Montessori is this like weird grassroots. Everybody's always kind of hated her. She doesn't fit in. Like she was kicked out of the country in 1916 and she never really came back in a kind of full-throated way until people identified her with, with progressive education. But other people in my life, like when I was in psychology, like Gibson is this, James Gibson is this like weirdo. Um, the mind is not like a computer. Like we have direct access to reality. Let's just describe the environment. He has this totally different approach to perception and action. Um, Baldwin has this different approach to race and civil rights. And he never, I, I love him. Um, he never sat well with the kind of civil rights movement or the black power movement or, or its critics. Um, Rand, um, the people on your podcast will probably know a little bit better, um, is, has always been iconoclastic and heterodox. Um, so just th- like, these are my intellectual influences and I love them all and they all hate, they probably all would disagree with one another. Um, and that's like, I feel like that's our kind of talent strategy. It's like, we're looking for people who are like a little bit off the beaten path, who are thinking fresh, who have interesting ideas. We're not even necessarily looking for them to agree with Montessori fully. Like that's that's a process that happens over time. I don't think you can rush that. It's like, are you intrigued even, you know, by, by it? Like, do you have questions? Like, great, like, let's get started. Let's see where it goes. And there's a certain kind of um, independence of thought that I, I think it's really important for, to, to our organization that we're like not a standard education company in any way. And that cuts really deep. And that, that, that affects our talent strategy. Well, that sets up a question that I wanted to get both of your feedback on. So in stressing that you have these kind of independent thinkers, there's a tremendous value in kind of bringing them together collaboratively. And how do you think about the relationship between having independent creative thinkers and the fact that when you can kind of get them together to work together on a common mission, you know, to cite a cliche, right? You get more than the sum of the parts. Yeah, it's a good question. And I mean, um, I think that there's, I think there's an assumption in what you're saying that there's a conflict there, but like the reality is like, it's, it's actually necessary. If you believe that like the insights that we need to arrive at and the innovations that we need to drive are not there handed to us, they're, they're latent, they're hidden. Like, this is one of the means to get at them. And so I actually think, is, I think like, it's just a question of setting the ground rules in the right way. Like you obviously have to, you know, the, 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 you know, we have OKRs, we have an organizational priorities Like people understand that when they're coming in. And again, if you look at the Montessori classroom, there are certain ground rules. You can only work with a material once you've been given a lesson, you know, one, one child, if it's on another child's rug, then it's in essentially theirs until they put it back on the shelf. And so th- I think there's an equivalent to that where like, um, um, uh, it, it, you know, if somebody believes that, you know, children should be seen and not heard and, and, and is completely con- contrary to us. Now we're going to go on their podcast. We're going to engage with them. We have something to learn from them, but they're not going to work at the organization. So there, there, you know, there is some kind of, you know, the, the kind of, um, 
affinity of, of purpose. Um, it's just that there's radically different judgments in terms of how to get there. There is also, I think, um, clear ownership. And so, you know, I, for example, if you took a, a, the guy Barnett who runs our real estate um, arm, um, he reports to me and I get all the time, like, like investors or contacts or others saying, you know what, you should take this property or you should do that. And the second I go like, and, and, and take a certain action. Now I, I own it in a certain way. Like I, you know, like the, the, I, I have to set a broader agenda, but I don't get involved at that level. And like, if I were doing many things, I would do them differently because I was built around my style, my personality, and he's building around his. And so like, I think that there is a sense in which everybody buys in and agrees with the fact that like in, in action, when there's something that has to be done, like, you know, this is the person that's going to make the call. And so there's, there's, uh, you know, is this Jeff Bezos? I'm not sure where this comes from, but it's like, you know, disagree and, and then affirm, like, you don't, you don't have to reach consensus um, within the system. Um, and even our school leaders, like our school leaders have tremendous agency in terms of how they drive, but something like health and safety, right. Or compliance, like, we're going to micromanage sometimes when there's a risk because we, we, you know, we can't take a risk with the, the, the life and safety of a child. So those things are not, those things are decided centrally, but they buy in. Everyone agrees. Everyone's on board. Right. And so there isn't that, there isn't that um, um, difference. Um, there's some kind of difference. Maybe Matt can speak to this about like the intellectual process of just like yeah. creating a culture of bouncing around ideas versus like, how do you yeah. run a business in action? And I, and, and I, and I think that we've somehow accomplished both of those things, but I, I don't know if I've articulated it clearly. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think just all those things plus on, on the kind of, you could call it the intellectual side, but this comes up in practical yeah. context all the time. I mean, what the kind of false alternative in the culture is, you know, either it's like, there are two opposing sides and you clash and it's just like, the, like you've got your tribes and there's a worldview difference and like you disagree or it's kumbaya. It's like, can't we all just get along? And um, and the, and the the third way, the thing that lets people with with differences engage with one another is argument. I mean, this is something that I take from um, from philosophy, from the academic philosophy culture. It's like like you you argue with one another, like have have out the debate, figure out where you disagree in the premises, um, let the chips fall where they may. You trust that like by a rational process and an objective process, the truth will come out. And I mean, this happens in the context of like. In a business context so like there are priorities and there are owners and um sometimes this is happening in the background and sometimes it lingers you know you know um for a while while people are kind of making decisions and taking action anyway but we have a, i mean we have a culture of argument and, and it's just it's been normalized in the way that and in, in a very similar way in a certain way that, that it is an academic philosophy i think that that's that's one of the best features of that culture is like it's like yeah like the truth is a blood sport like get in there and make the argument yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and I know that one of the places where we've had challenges because we have a matrix matrix structure is where there isn't isn't clear ownership over a decision um, where um, multiple people feel ownership and, and, and it's not clear you know you know who's driving that decision and so I, I think that 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 um, um, it's that it's that kind of approach to ownership combined combined with a kind of like celebration and romanticization of like you know, violent disagreement, that's fine. Like that's normal, right? Um, that combination, I think, is what does it. So let's, I want to end on this, which is we talked about sort of how Montessori in her own time saw the relationship between education and progress. How do you guys think about, you know, where we are as a culture and what and how what you're doing in education can continue sure. improving human progress in terms of knowledge, science, technology. Yeah. I mean, else. you know, one point um, that ties together a lot of what we we're talking about is the, the coming world and, you know, the, the kind of um, um, the, the landscape that's emerging that I, you know, we can kind of project um, demands a certain type of self-regulation. And, um, and even when we hire people, like one of the things, you know, I, 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 um, I, check for and we talk a lot about is like energy management managing your own energy self-regulation like it used to be that time management is what made you like a great professional right like you can manage your time but that's today just permission to play like that is like it's can you manage your own energy do you know when you need a break do you know when you need to go 
take a day off? Do you need to know, do you know when you need to cancel your weekend plans to get your work done? Like, do you know when you're like losing the kind of forest for the trees and what things you do to reorient yourself? Like those skills are really important. And there, and, and, and I think that the kind of feature emerging feature of the modern world is like connection and choice. Right. And there's, it's like, you're more under your control and, and, and that requires that type of orientation. And so that's like for us, the, the, the through line um, from like what we do in the classroom to our approach to talent to ultimately like where we see the world, um, um, you know, headed and that kind of qualities that, 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 that allow for human flourishing. In that kind of world. Yeah. And then I, I just add on just within education, kind of on the, like, what are we doing? And like, how is it progress? Like, I, I think there's a lot of forces converging to make this a very, very exciting time for education. I'm as cynical and as tired and as burned out as people are in education and I get it. Like, I, I mean, um, th that's, that's a very reasonable um, kind of gestalt and starting position. My view is kind of seeing all the ed tech startups, seeing all the kind of pressures within the industry from early childhood to higher ed, seeing what's happening in ed tech um, seeing seeing the promise of um, of Montessori and even kind of related sister ideologies and approaches that are kind of picking up on some more things. Um, I mean, education has always been this kind of conservative, backwards, broken, half thought through thing. That that's what it's been for three thousand years, with occasional bursts of light that that haven't really gone anywhere. And I, I feel like we're actually poised now. The wealth of society, the, the energy that people have towards children, the kind of insights about the importance of development, um, the resources that we have to actually do it, the technological tools, um, how fed up people are with the status quo, how ephemeral the status quo actually is, what we think of as the status quo in education, like K-12 education plus everybody goes to college. It's so recent. Like, and it's not that entrenched. It's not nearly as entrenched as everybody thinks it is. Um, the pressure from the modern world in terms of the workforce needs and, and the accessibility of great content and knowledge. Like it's, it's the best time to be a child. It's the best time to be a student. It's the best time to be an educator or a parent or a learner or a teacher. Um, it, it's just, I think we're going to see like, you know, Bell Labs, Kitty Hawk levels of kind of innovation and iteration and just, you know, 30, 50 years from now, it's just not going to look the same. And um, yeah, we're, I mean, we're just excited to be part of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if I can add, like, the, 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 like that spirit, like, and, and Matt just expresses it so eloquently. It's, you know, I see that, you know, it's part of what we want to convey to the world. Like, there is, you know, magic happens at the kind of intersection of like latent market demand and unborrowed vision. And, you know, the kind of famous, like, you know, Henry Ford, you know, if you asked him what he want, people, they would have said a better horse. You know, yes, but people wanted, like, independent autonomous travel like it's not actually true like the fact is there was all sorts of signals that people wanted you know uh, the, the automobile there's all sorts of signals that people wanted something like the iphone right like and and it's it's that it's that vision plus the kind of demand and um i think that there is this kind of um the the amount of insights there have been in psychology and, and learning science over the last 30 years the amount of thinking that there has been done around the d design, if you look at like the improvements in film and media, obviously technology and the kind of like, you know, the kind of the emergent um, systems and algorithms, like it, it's, it's a hard perspective, but it's like it's teed up for something pretty dramatic that is gonna be pretty, I think, um, tremendously obvious in, in, in retrospect, um, but we can just get whispers of it, right? And, and, and that's a, you know, it's, that's why, like, you know, I, I wouldn't want to be doing anything else, you know, and, and I want to draw all the best talent that, in the yeah. world. Yeah. yeah. I mean, COVID has accelerated all of this too. I mean, this, I mean, it's an obvious point, but you might as well make it in this context that, um, I mean, the number of people that are kind of fed up with the status quo has kind of like, you know, quintupled at least over the last year and not just like the remote learning temporary thing, but they're just like, what is the system even in its normal state? Like that, that's the kind of question that people are asking themselves. And that's one of the tailwinds. So. Um, I mean, I thought this before COVID and I think of more now. So. How can people learn more? Our website's to higherground.com. You can just Google higher ground education, um, guidepost Montessori. Uh, if you're a parent, certainly if you're a parent, um, get on our newsletters. Um, we have a lot of stuff for you at home, even if we don't have a school in your area. 
Uh, Matt and I are both active on Twitter. You can more Matt more than me, but uh, you can reach out to us. Um, and we, you know, we are trying to do something dramatic, and we will take all the help we can get from from people that want to work with us, to people who want to help open schools, to people that want to invest, to people that want to just um, just just be supportive. Uh, um, so you know, find us on Twitter, or uh, you know, you, there's sign up there's sign ups on each of our websites. All right, thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Don. Yeah. All right.